Hi, welcome back to the Bibli Bibliographical Society of America's annual meeting, which continues now with our keynote lecture sponsored by Christie's. I'm honored and delighted to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Derek Spires, Associate Professor of Literatures in English and affiliate, affiliate faculty in American Studies at Cornell University. I first encountered Dr. Spires at Black, the Black Bibliographia Print Culture Art Conference at the University of Delaware in 2019, and later in the same year at the Black Bibliography Project Conference at the Beinecke Library. Dr. Spires' work struck me then, and it still does, as the best of bibliography and what it can do and be, a scholarly practice that makes relevant textual artifacts by showing what they once meant and what they mean now for human life. His book, The Practice of Citizenship, Black Politics and Print Culture in the Early United States has won four prizes, including our own Mercantile Library Prize and the MLA First Book Prize. It shows how black print gave a material form to the theory and practice of black citizenship. The circulation of printed matter in early America helped to shape black communities and meet their social, political and cultural needs. In today's talk entitled Liberation Bibliography, Dr. Spires offers a conscious and intentional practice of identifying and repairing the harms of systemic racism, anti-blackness, sexism, heteronormativity, and other oppressive forces in and through bibliographical study broadly conceived. I've been eagerly awaiting this talk since we invited Dr. Spires to speak in February of 2020. So without further ado, I will hand the mic over to him. Thank you, Dr. Spires, for joining us today. Thank you, Aaron, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and thanks to everyone who's tuned in today and really throughout this week. I speak to you from Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, which is located on the traditional homelands of the Cayuga Nation. The Cayuga are pe members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a history and contemporary presence on this land and a democratic form of governance that served as a model for the US Constitution. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the history of the Cuga dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Cuga people past and present to these lands and waters. I've learned a great deal from this year's BSA programming, especially the virtual seminars. Indeed, from the book print Artist Scholars of Color Collective Sessions to this week's workshops, the BSA seminars and other virtual events have showcased scholars doing the work of liberation bibliography. They have helped me articulate the concept to myself and hopefully to you today. And I want to give special shout outs to our sponsors, to BSA President Barbara Shaler, to BSA Executive Director Aaron McGurl, and the Council for their commitment to expanding the BSA, to ethical work, and to helping facilitate our conversations around material objects, systemic racism, and structural repair, conversations that need to be ongoing. If we were live, I'd ask you to give a round of applause. Instead, I'll just pause and thank you so much. You can find recordings of all of these events over on the BSA's YouTube channel, and there should be a link to a file with links to um, other programs and um, archives that I mentioned throughout my talk. I especially appreciated the opportunity this year to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Dorothy Porter's landmark essay, Early American Negro Writings, a Bibliographical Study, published in papers of the Bibliographical Society of America in 1945. But, um, and I did so, we did so by organizing a seminar on Porter's work with Laura Helton, featuring Dorothy Berry, Janet Sims Wood, and Melanie Shambliss. Part of my purpose here will be to continue that celebration in recognition of the 50th anniversary of Porter's Early Negro Writing, a foundational collection of African-American writing from, the seven, from 1760 to 1837. Porter began her career in Howard University's library in 1930, and she became the first African-American woman to receive an MLS from Columbia University in 1932. For the next 43 years, she would revolutionize the study of bibliography and bibliographical studies as she built what would become the Moreland Springer 
Research Center, a central archive for the study of the African diaspora, and as she sought out creative and principled ways of making Black knowledge production not only visible, but searchable and findable through multiple volumes of bibliography and primary sources, as well as her regularly published bibliographies and articles in journals such as the African Studies Bulletin. As new work from Helton, Zita Nunez, and Autumn Womack traces, she was also instrumental in developing the American Negro reprint series by Arno Press, the series responsible for the distinctive black and white volumes and of texts like the Anglo-African Magazine and Howard Holman Bell's History of the Colored Conventions Movement. These volumes, plus the Schomburg 19th Century Black Women Writers series and the work from the feminist press were the backbone of much of my graduate study and the work I continued doing today. Finally, shout out to Jacinta Saffold and the, winners, the winner of the inaugural, inaugural Dorothy Porter Wesley Fellowship, as well as this year's new scholars, Matthew Bouchard, Sophia Brown, and Ryan Lowe. I encourage everyone listening here to consider a donation to the BSA to ensure that the Porter Wesley Fellowship gets endowed in perpetuity. I also encourage you to check out the Porter Bibliography on the BSA's website, which includes work by Porter, as well as recent scholarship on Porter, much of which is free to access thanks to the BSA and Project Muse. So I write about early African-American print culture and politics. It's the ground on which I stand and the field that informs everything I'll say here today. This is not to say that I don't aim to offer a call of sorts to us all, but rather to note that this talk as I give it today would not have been possible without access to microfilm holdings, bound volumes, curatorial wisdom, and archives, both formal and informal. And I lives with the work of historians, bibliographers, archivists, and others who long before I arrived, cared for, curated, and framed black writing in ways that would speak to me in the 20th and 21st century. Scholars of African-American literature and print culture have been long been attending to the early Negro writings uh, to draw on Porter's foundational work for decades. Carla Peterson, Elizabeth McHenry, Francis Smith Foster, Joycelyn Moody, Mary Emma Graham, and others have built on Porter to give us a robust sense of these writings emanating from a variety of collectives, including mutual aid societies, religious and fraternal organizations, newspapers, literary societies, and labor unions. The field they help define is not just about the recovery of text or troubling a canon. Rather, they are invested in creating deeper and more fulfilling understandings of the expressive print cultures Black communities created across time. For now, today, the question for us is how are we caring for, curating, and framing the work so that those who follow us might similarly find themselves? Dominique Polanco used the word stewardship yesterday, and I rather like it. What use does bibliographical study serve in a moment of national reckoning once again with systemic racism and open white supremacy? What does it mean to do bibliography in a time when digitization and open access have made more text available, if not accessible, to more people than ever before? And I'm gonna pause for just a minute because I've lost my slide connection. One sec. There we go. All right. Porter provides one directive in the introduction to her working bibliography on the Negro in the United States, published in 1969. Quote, unless order is brought to this literary outpouring, the flood will overwhelm those who are most in need of this literature. Selective, authoritative bibliographies are essential in improving access to Negro literature. Emphasis on those who need it most. Writing some 40 years later, Barbara Pfister echoes Porter's insistence on access and a focus on reaching those who need literature the most. Liberation bibliography rests on the idea that the role of libraries is not just to provide access to information, but to provide access that is liberating. I'd add to Fister's list archives, bookstores, book history and classrooms, and our collective scholarship. No space or work is neutral. To not work towards liberation does not mean the work isn't working towards something else. 
Both Porter and Pfister offer instances of what this talk discusses in terms of liberation bibliography. Drawing on liberation theology developed in Latin American and African American contexts by Gustavo Gutierrez, James Cohn, and others, along with Black feminist studies, Black feminist cr criticism, and feminist bibliography, this talk offers liberation bibliography as a conscious and intentional practice of identifying and repairing the harms of systemic racism, settler colonialism, heteropatriarchy, and other oppressive structures in and through bibliographical study that is the study of books and manuscripts as physical objects broadly conceived. In its simplest form, liberation theology posits that God is on the side of the oppressed. Freedom is not a rational decision about possible alternatives, James Cone argues in A Black Theology of Liberation. Quote, it is a participation of the whole person in the liberation struggle. Extrapolating from Cone, John Ernest, who coined the concept of liberation historiography to describe African-American history writing, explains that this work actively seeks an understanding of the systemic conditions that shape individuals and communal life, but it does so as part of a central commitment to action in the world. To return to Porter and Pfister, access and liberation are about action and a commitment to understanding and repairing harm on a structural level. Bibliography does work in the world as much as it enables others to do work in the world. How are we facilitating that work? Projects from David Walker's Appeal to the Colored Citizens of the World, first published in 1829, to the Color Conventions Project and Race Before Race, both ongoing in 2021, model liberation bibliography as a practice of freedom. It is not a destination, but rather an ethics and methodology. It marks the necessity of thinking bibliography through the needs of minoritized and oppressed communities and centers the ongoing work, both traditional and non-traditional, emanating from these communities. Liberation bibliography makes visible those knowledge systems and sites of knowledge production, activism, and possibility that institutions have historically rendered invisible or irrelevant. Finally, liberation bibliography changes and challenges how we do this work. With scholars and projects focusing simultaneously on the ethics of studying the book, at the same time as they engage in an ongoing reconsideration of citational practices, archives, power, and our relation to them. So Porter's early Negro writing was my first introduction to the world of what we now think of as Black print culture and bibliography. And though I didn't know it at the time, it was also among the first introductions to something like liberation bibliography. I was in graduate school at the time and trying to figure out how to talk about Absalom Jones and Richard Allen's 1794 narrative of the proceedings of the Black people, their account of the 1793 yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia and the first copyrighted document by African Americans. And I was also becoming aware of a host of Black ephemeral and periodical writing that my previous training, which focused almost exclusively on material published in books, were insufficient. I was talking this over with my undergraduate mentor, Dr. Jerry Ward from Tougaloo College, and he told me to get a copy of Dorothy Porter's early Negro writing, as if that one collection would solve all of my graduate student angst. And he wasn't totally wrong. I felt like I was getting inducted into some secret society. Um, framing the work as early Negro writing gave her and us wide latitude with the kinds of things we might consider, the kinds of things that mattered in a way that doesn't necessarily leave literature and literariness behind, but that does get to something more fundamental in nature and loses the baggage of the more restrictive principles of selection and value based in, in assessing how closely Black print mirrored or reproduced the forms and structures of white print. I want to linger with Porter's or her publisher's choice of AME minister Jarena Lee as the cover image for the first edition. The writers represented in early Negro writing are mainly men, which makes Lee's prominence all the more significant. I wonder if Porter found in Lee a kindred spirit and model of a subversive approach to making institutional space where one's presence has been discounted, ignored, or shunted to the side. According to her own account, Jarena Lee was called to preach in the early 1800s, and from that point forward, pressed against gendered, doctrinal, and racist boundaries to spread the word of God as she saw it. 
After roughly 20 years of work, she published her reflections on this journey, both spiritual and physical, in 1836 as a short pamphlet of roughly 29 pages titled The Life and Religious Experience of Jarena Lee, a Colored Lady, one of, if not the first published autobiographies by a Black woman in the United States and another early copyrighted Black text. Through this short narrative, we learned that Lee's struggle was less access to the word. She attended several churches, learned to read and interpret scripture, to scripture herself, and after some pushing was even allowed to exhort that is, encourage the congregation after the male minister's sermon. The struggle was over the power to explain and interpret the word publicly. She could read, exhort, and teach in small parlor room groups of women, but she could not preach until she broke out of the institutional constraints of the church and found her way to the revivalist circuit across the country. Lee's life is a case of both and a reflection on the relationship between material form and content. She had the pamphlet copyrighted in Philadelphia in 1836, and it was reprinted at least once in Cincinnati, Ohio, because Lee explains of the original, it went off as by a wind, and there was high demand for more. Lee paid for these printings herself. The presence of a copyright notice suggests Lee's print savvy, and her sense that even though her life was published in an ephemeral format, its intellectual content was her unique and enduring contribution. So, Lee not only redefined gender roles in the AME church, she also redefined how and where the word could be delivered and interpreted. As Dolores Williams would later argue about woman is God talk, Lee's example does not merely add to what we know, it changes what we know and how we know it. Embedded in an institutional setting that sought to contain her, Lee took her work outside and built new pathways. She leveraged the new print technologies of the day that made on-demand printing cheaper, and she took advantage of new networks created during the revivalisms of the 1830s. Lee's approach to the Word of God is a textbook example of liberation theology at work. At the same time, her navigation of denominational protocols is an eerie reminder of how many Black scholars and scholars of Black bibliography, including Porter, have had to navigate institutional spaces ostensibly privileged on liberation and democracy, but that work to exclude them. As Porter biographer Janet Sims Wood notes, Porter was likely tracked in the librarianship to begin with as one of the few academic pursuits open to women, let alone Black women, at the time. While the cover for the 1995 paperback edition of Early Negro Writing changed to feature Lee situated between two other preachers, James Wharton, and Lemuel Haynes, Porter's original argument about the document she included remained the same. Quote, it may be enough to realize that here we have the beginnings of the Afro-Americans artistic consciousness, indeed the first articulations of the appeal of beauty and the moral sense, a phenomena of unexpected early appearance in the course of Black experience in America, end quote. A few things to note in Porter's remarks. Yes, much of the writing she describes and collects focuses on Black freedom seeking, and yet Porter also resists categorizing this writing as purely protest, documentary, or sociological in nature, as in don't come to this writing with the idea that all of Black life can be reduced to struggle against white supremacy, or that all Black readers and writers were focused singularly on appealing to a white audience. The cover's emphasis on Black religious institutions and spiritual life is a part of that reconfiguration towards Black self-expression and institution building. Second, I'm struck by how Porter describes this seeking of the beautiful and the moral as appearing unexpectedly early. Under what intellectual constraints have we been operating to make this seeking seem unexpected or unexpectedly early? What happens when we instead assume that there's a there there? and start looking for it actively. For me, there was something liberating in shifting focus from a reactive framework to focus instead on Black literary culture, because it suggested a print world developing on its own terms, and in turn, it compelled me to learn those terms and shape my own work through them. One result of this reframing is, per is Porter's early cataloging efforts. As she writes in 1945, before texts by African Americans were identified as such in the catalogs, Porter did the work of poring over documents to identify Black writers so that she could collect more effectively and could offer more complete bibliographies. In 
This labeling corrected a cataloging practice in which not naming could be equated with erasure, and at the same time, insufficient differentiation within categories like Negro writing could flatten what is such a wide ranging assemblage. A second result is the way Porter organizes early Negro writing. She provides subcategories that remain unique in their articulation of Black writing from the perspective of how Black writers use print. So within early Negro writing, we have mutual aid and fraternal organizations, education societies, significant annual conferences, narratives, poems, and essays, etc. By focusing on more ephemeral materials like pamphlets, convention minutes, and periodical literature, Porter and others, including John Blassingame and Meiji Henderson, fleshed out a fuller representation of Black writing through the modes Black writers use most often and against the grain of a 20th and now 21st century tendency, at least in literary studies, to value bound books, novels, and other forms. And I'll add that the field has caught up to them. Um, so, in this next stage, I want to offer two examples of liberation bibliography at work, two examples that accentuate um, the project Porter set out, one from the 19th century and the others from the 21st century. The first example is a callback to Monday's fantastic session on Phyllis Wheatley Peters by Jonathan Sinchin, Bridget Fielder, Ashley Cataldo, and Honoré Fanon Jeffers. As Fielder mentioned, William J. Wilson features Wheatley's head in his African American Picture Gallery series, an imagined gallery where his pseudonymous persona, Ethiop, browses art objects expressing the breadth and depth of Black aesthetics and history. The series appeared in the Anglo African magazine across 1859, and you can find a fantastically teachable digital edition of the series edited by Britt Russert and Leif Ekstrom through the American Antiquarian Society's Just Teach One Early African American Print Initiative. Thomas Hamilton founded the Anglo African Magazine with his brother Robert in 1859 as an outlet for the 12 millions of Blacks in the United States to speak for themselves. Most of us encountered the Anglo African in the familiar black and white binding of Arno Press. And in fact, I saw it for the first time on the bookshelf. I wasn't looking for it, it was just there. Um, and this reprint includes this print of Alexander Dumas. Um, this opening statement of the magazine's intent uh, functions, suggests that it intended to function as a serious literary space rooted in an explicitly black intellectual tradition. William J. Wilson's African American Picture Gallery series participates in this project as both display and training ground, a space where one might come on a ramble for entertainment or study and where the careful observer and thinker might find much that is valuable and interesting. It's important to note though, that the imagined gallery that the series described is an exercise in reverse ekphrasis. The images don't exist in life, or at least not in the ways that uh, Wilson's Ethiop character describes them. And the gallery itself isn't a real place per se. Instead, both offer a prompt and a guide, a call for black art, as well as perhaps more importantly, a call for the kinds of spaces and writing that would bring people and encourage them to engage in conversation around that art. So initially, Ethiop describes Wheatley's head, which is a bust of Wheatley's head rather than a classic frontispiece engraving, in ethnological terms to situate her in an intellectual pantheon and to help us visualize the bust, quote, the facial angle contains full 90 degrees, the forehead is finely formed and the brain large, the nose is long and the nostrils thin, while the eyes, though not large, are well set. The whole makeup of this face, Wilson concludes, is an index of healthy intellectual powers combined with an active temperament over which has fallen a slight. What slight does this countenance communicate? Quote, stolen at the tender age of seven years from the fond embrace of a mother whose image never once faded from her memory, a delicate child, a girl, alone, desolate, a chilly, dreary world before her, an iron mask on her head. What chance, what opportunity was there for her to make physical, moral, or mental progress? End quote. 
Instead of the benevolent enslavers featured in early accounts of Phyllis Wheatley, like Margaret O'Dell's memoir and poems of Phyllis Wheatley published in 1834, Wilson's Wheatley carries an iron mask on her head, signaling the enslavers implements of physical torture and the pressure of Anglo-American anti-Blackness weighing on the child's psyche. Wilson's 1859 account anticipates more recent scholarship, including Honoré Jeffers' The Age of Phyllis, and the current call for a special issue on Wheatley in early American literature. He shows Wheatley's embeddedness in a rich social world, including memories of a mother's love and correspondences with friends like Uber Tanner, which were known in Massachusetts archival circles in the 1850s. As he crafts this description, Wilson might have had in mind contemporaneous bibliographical and anthology accounts premising Wheatley's fame on her blackness as a curiosity rather than on her literary merit. Sarah J. Hale's Woman's Record, published in 1853, a compendium of writing by American women meant as a kind of feminist archive, uh, but one decidedly white in values, includes Wheatley. And yet, here's how Wheatley's inclusion get, gets framed. Poems on various subjects, quote, is worth arises from the extraordinary circumstances that they are the production of an African woman. Um, African woman is italicized. Hell's diversity and inclusion initiative reinscribes the very ideologies that, at least on some level, Wheatley's inclusion in the collection might work against. Part of the lesson for us here is that it is quite possible to diversify collections, acquisitions, and canons while maintaining the same basic structure. What good is collecting more texts by Native Americans if the institution refuses to acknowledge and reckon with its foundation in indigenous land dispossession, and those texts remain inaccessible to the communities that produce them? And as Tao Goff reminded me, when some of those holdings include actual bodies, this is a question my own institution is asking now. Are we doing readers and buyers a service by highlighting diverse or Black Lives Matter themed holdings, or if you're Disney Plus, developing a Black category of streaming media, if they only matter because of guilt or some rush to understand a phenomenon that's not going away, even though if the past is any indication, the special categories and how to be anti-racist list likely will disappear as soon as white supremacy returns to comfortable levels of invisibility. But I digress. Wilson reframes Wheatley's literary accomplishments as an indictment of whiteness and as a foundation for a liberatory literary culture. Both and, as Joseph Rezek reminds us, much of the response to Wheatley's, Wheatley's work was necessitated by the bookness of her collection. She'd published poems in periodicals and had read in parlors for years before poems on various subjects appeared in print. The bookness of this collection, durable, transmittable, hefty, meant it could not be ignored. Yet Wilson omits Thomas Jefferson and others' racist responses to that volume, opting instead to center Wheatley's life and the lessons it offers. In so doing, he intervenes in a historical sensibility that often positions that often positions critiquing Jefferson and white supremacy as the point from which Black writing emerges, even if Jefferson was the one responding to Wheatley. Here, I'm also thinking about the way Honoré Jefferson's insistence on Wheatley-Peters in our naming practice compels us to decenter her enslavers and her enslavement as the touchstones of Wheatley-Peters' life. She was a young woman who loved, was savvy about her print circulation and spiritual life, and tried to build and sustain a family. There's pleasure in encountering these materials from this framework, rather than allow Jefferson and Odell to place us on the defensive. It's a realization that systemic racism and minoritizing discourses are not natural and are themselves responsible responses to, as Caritha Mitchell reminds us, Black excellence. <clears throat> Something else we learned from Wilson's African-American picture gallery. It's open to the public and is structured to encourage conversation. In the fictional account, Ethiop is constantly trying to bar the gallery to people who, see, who he sees as intruders, and young Tom, the gallery attendant, consistently thwarts his efforts. In fact, young Tom takes great pleasure in placing Ethiop in situations that challenge his attempts to exert his own sense of authority and hierarchy over the gallery's objects. 
forcing Ethiop instead to engage with people he might not even have given the time of day on the street. This is one of the gallery's structural principles, not just a special initiative. The gallery attendant facilitates these democratic encounters and actively blocks one of the gallery's most prominent patrons from turning it into his private resort. What we learn is that liberation bibliography is as much about infrastructural accessibility as in access to the physical and digital space with an eye towards mitigating ableism, as well as cultural accessibility. As Jesse Erickson noted during one of the rare and distinctive collect collection sessions organized by Cornell um, librarian Tamar Doherty, historical memory is etched into the infrastructure and design of our collections. And that memory from the halls lined often with portraits of largely white men to the security, to the placement of non-European collections, shapes how we do our work, communicates what the institution finds valuable and important and conditions our experience. So I'm also reminded of Sister Jeffers' uh, tangents. Um, she reminded me of going back to Ashley Farmer's Archiving Wild Back Black, uh, which asks a few pertinent questions. What does it mean for the student or researcher of color to have to tread halls lined with images of elder white men on their way to access and care for black texts? Are people being policed and surveilled in ways that make doing the work nearly impossible? This gets me back to Pfister, whose primary focus is on libraries as democratic institutions, or what she describes as the commons of the university. How do we shape that commons, whether library, store, classroom, or writing, as an inviting space that, again, thinking back to Erickson's talk, encourages collaboration, conversation, and the cross-pollination of various kinds of knowledge and modes of knowledge production. So my second example of liberation bibliography comes from present-day scholars. Um, scholars and projects focusing simultaneously on the ethics of studying Black print and life, and at the same time, engaging in an ongoing reconsideration of archives, power, and our relation to them. As Fielder and Sinchin note in their introduction to Against a Sharp, a Sharp White Background, while it is exciting and necessary to do recovery work on early Black writing and print, it is equally necess necessary to study the historical library bibliographical standards and contemporary digital architectures that kept such works hidden and in need of recovery today. You can't see this, but in their quote, hidden is in quotes, because as I hope it's become clear, much of this writing has been known to scholars of African-American print, but ignored actively and passively in the academy until recently. Black digital humanities projects in the spirit of Porter's foundational work continue these efforts even as we enter new phases of confronting the limitations and possibilities of digital platforms. The Colored Conventions Project, the Black Bibliography Project, the Black Book Interactive Project, and Black Self-Publishing, um, all of these projects have been among the most explicit recent projects, and I could name many more, in thinking about the ethics of digitization, bibliography, and scholarship, and in linking these principles not only to Black studies and Black feminist practices, but also to the ideas circulating in Black print itself. The CCP, for instance, quote, affirms Black women's centrality to 19th century Black organizing, even as official records erase and an anonymize the very contributions, labor, and infrastructure that made the color convention move it possible. And they pledge to account for the women's leadership and labor in their own historical work in our own project principles. In other words, the color convention's project's reparative work applies not only to contemporary archival practices, but also gendered exclusions in the 19th century records keeping. The project's insistence on community source knowledge production reinforces community, horizontal organization, and collaboration as key principles in a mirror of the Color Conventions project, the project archives. I also see this work happening in places like the Dark Laboratory a project developed by my Cornell colleagues, Tal Goff and Jeffrey Clymer. The Dark Lab presents a highly collaborative community-centered project aimed at bringing the symbiotic histories of Black and Indigenous coalition to the surface in order to build future worlds of co-production 
and coexistence in the face of ongoing conquests. Their philosophy, quote, is to learn from Black and Indigenous traditions about how to tell a good story with a sense of the common good, ethical grounds, and the value of being an engaging storytelling using multimedia. They are not just adding Black and Indigenous voices to a pre-constituted space. Instead, they ground their work in understanding the methods and values of Black and Indigenous communities and letting those methods and values shape their process. The result of this reframing should help us better achieve Porter's call to develop work centering on those most in need and the members of the communities from which our institutions have historically extracted their materials. I want to close on this point. Porter and others teach us that lists, catalogs, organizational principles, bookshop displays, and the like are all arguments about what matters, how they matter, and ways of knowing. The same applies to citational practices. You might have noticed throughout this talk that I've named many names and given several shout outs. I couldn't give a talk about, around liberation bibliography without speaking in and through community because thinking about the both and of bibliography along these lines means being intentional and even reparative about citational practices. Hashtag cite black women, hashtag cite a sister, and women also know history all point to citation as a systemic problem of erasure. As a graduate student, I rarely saw scholars of African-American literature, print culture, and black studies cited in American literary studies, print culture, or book history, even when those studies were focused on African-American literature, though I'd argue strongly that their work should be cited in most American literary studies, broadly conceived. It was as if my own writing was engaging in two parallel conversations in different houses, and while one house was required to be aware of the conversations happening next door, that our house could attend or not as they pleased. I see this changing and it has changed over the last decade, yet digitization has increased the rate of discoveries in minoritized literatures without a concomitant dedication to attending to the scholars, scholarship and institutions like HBCUs that have been attending to this work for decades. And as Kirsten Silver Grews reminded us just a couple of days ago, this is also shaped by my language, region, and U.S. national formations about what texts matter and why. These asymmetries have made me more conscious of my own practice because my own unearned privileges and the grounds on which I stand mean that I am bound to miss or otherwise overlook important work that isn't being cited across fields. In my classes, I've begun including the following clause in research assignments. While I will not assign a set number if your bibliography contains only men, no scholars of color, or no black women, you're likely missing something very important. The statement needs expansion, and this semester I want to spend some time with my students talking over my own elisions. I also encourage students not to dismiss a source just because it's older or published from a press that isn't Cambridge or Oxford. So I name names in an effort to think publicly in community. At its core, my research, including my book, The Practice of Citizenship, is about the questions and methodologies that emerge when we focus our analysis on the concerns Black writers made foremost and on the understanding these concerns in the terms they set forth. In that spirit, I want to end by returning to Porter. Um, I want to ask Porter to have the last word. Quote, the motive underlying nearly all these contributions was the love of freedom. So that within a surprising variety of composition, one finds after all a certain homogeneity arising from general consciousness of the writers that in their world, they were fellow sufferers with all mankind, though the accident of birth and had marked them for special suffering. Thank you. I look forward to the questions and answer session. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Uh, you can't see it out there, but there's a green room of folks here who are who are clapping vigorously um, for you, Derek. So thank you very much.
Um, I'm going to take a look at some of the questions that have been submitted in a second here, and I'll encourage you in the meantime to please continue submitting your questions for Derek to the Q&A. Um, but I want to get us started with a question about pleasure. Um, you mentioned that earlier in your talk, and I think that so many of us in the bibliographical community really find so much of what we do as bibliographers to be deeply pleasurable, um, especially when we are working with materials in person, uh, which we obviously can't do now. But I've, I wondered if you could talk about the role of pleasure in liberation bibliography a little bit more specifically, or if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I think part of it is about focus. Um, and this came from when I was a um, graduate student because I would be in coursework and whenever we'd read anything from Black writers, it was in the context of enslavement. It was in the context of all of the uh, rhetorical and structural bending a writer would have to do to please a white audience, to get them to see their humanity. And that sort of kind of reading, that litany of trying and trying and bumping your head against the wall started to weigh on me. Um, and I figured there had to be more out there than what the scholarship was citing, what typically was anthologized. Um, and that was what took me to Porter, um, or at least what attracted me to Porter, because for the first time for me, there was this panoply of stuff that didn't fit into the kind of protest um, category. And for the first time for me, there are these writers who were creating life for themselves. They were writing to themselves, for themselves, and creating entire cultures that I say this and I feel a, a bit, um, I say, embarrassed to put it this way because it sounds like a big surprise. Like, oh, you mean intelligent people were just living life and writing and exploring spirituality and cracking jokes in newspapers? Wow, you don't say. But at the time, it really did seem like a wow, you don't say that Black folks with access to print in the 18th century would crack jokes, right? Uh, even though in the middle of COVID and everything else that was going on this year, many of us found ourselves cracking jokes, right? Um, so that was part of the pleasure. There's also like a special pleasure in just getting embedded in a, in, in a culture and an archive. So just reading Frederick Douglass's paper, for instance, or diving into the Black abolitionist papers and just reading articles, getting a feel for who's who, what are the relationships like, what are, what are they doing with the language? And I get a sense of this that was happening in all the presentations from the emerging scholars presentations too. There's just a kind of joy in sort of getting in on the gossip, right? And not necessarily on discovering things per se that's new to the world, to everybody, but discovering things that are new to me. Like there's a, there's a, a mid 19th century version of social media. It's writing in newspapers using pseudonyms and pseudonyms are kind of like, you know, Twitter handles and people are using the media in really interesting and inventive ways that our 21st century paradigms don't have the language to explain. So that's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's just fun to get lost in a rabbit hole and then you have to climb back up and write about it. And that's, that can be fun too. <laughs> But sometimes just getting lost, it's joy. Thanks. Yeah, I feel very much the same way. Um, so there's a question here, and thank you for submitting your questions. Please keep doing it. Um, this one is from Dorothy Berry. How do you cite for possible inclusions the sort of reparative bibliographic work Porter did behind the scenes that tech staff do today, often anonymously? And I think Dorothy is probably talking about by tech staff, she means library catalogers and other other um, technical services staff in libraries. But Dorothy, just pop a note in the Q&A if that's not what you meant and I'll correct us. Oh, 
Derek, I think your mic is off. Yeah, it's teaching time, folks. I'm muted. Um, <laughs> uh, I think that this is this is a question that gets to citation style guides, right? The MLA, um, Chicago, and other style guides don't have great answers for collaborative projects, for projects that involve hosts of people. And one of the things, um, one of the great things that folks at the Color Conventions Project are working on is a particular way of citing their exhibits that gives credit to the host of students and other people who make an exhibit what it is. So naming those names. Um, and so one answer would be getting inventive and creative and like maybe even breaking some style um, and just naming as many names as possible as we can in that entry. Um, I also, and this goes against some of the style guides for journals and other places. I like to think of my footnotes as kind of sometimes um, intellectual love letters. And so I think, and, and Dorothy's question has me thinking more about this. That's another place where um, we should be talking about all the people who um, make something like um, the Color Conventions Project or a like basic metadata possible, right? And some of that's figuring out how to find names of people because it's hard to find names of people who do that because it's backgrounded. So, um, so that's a great question. And it's something I'm continuing to think through and working through and against the conventions of academic writing to work it. Um, thank you. I'm going to ask a question now from Mark Matz. And forgive me, I'm sorry there's a word limit or a character limit in your Q&A box. So this question is broken up into two parts. Just be patient with me as I string them together. Um, so he says, thank you for detailing Porter's commitment to understanding media forms and formats as liberating us from restricted uses or genre, of genre or the literary. He says those in quotes. Can you point to moments when Porter and others working in anti-racist bibliography find the literary a compelling category for liberating bibliography? Yeah, I think it's in the way she um, carves out space in um, her bibliography of Negro writing to signal explicitly aesthetic production. Right? She says, you might not believe it, but in this work from the late 18th, early 19th century, we see literature. Um, she has categories for poetry and narrative and fiction in early Negro writing that if you compare early Negro writing to contemporaneous um, collections, that's sort of absent. It's The focus is usually on polemic, on oratory, um, explicitly and expressly protest style literature and Porter is sort of shifting us away from that. Um, so the, that's one thing I'd point to for Porter. She also did bibliographies of African American fiction. She did bibliographies of Afro Brazilian fiction um, and poetry. She updated um, poetry bibliographies. So she's someone who actively sought out literature as literature, as its own category of writing, partly, I think, um, because she's a lover, lover of the word, like doing things with words, but also partly because she saw value, I think, again, ahead of the curve in lists of literature as literature, right? That Black literary production was happening across the centuries and not just beginning with, say, the Harlem Renaissance or the Black Arts Movement. I hope that gets to your question. Um, I'm going to ask a question here from um, an anonymous member of the audience. Um, do you ever feel resistance from bibliographic practices in using them for liberatory purposes? For example, can key texts in, I assume you mean bibliographical history, be used for this? So I'm thinking of, you know, can we cite something like um, Roger, uh, Ga Philip Gaskell, when we're talking about liberation bibliography? Yeah, I think so. Um, I was looking back because, yeah, one of the books on my shelf is, well, right on my desk. Okay. 
uh, can't see it. Um, it says William Robinson's Phyllis Wheatley a bio bibliography, right? Um, and I think just uh, not just thinking about the act of enumerating, um, and this is work that the Black Bibliography Project is sort of on the cutting edge of doing, not just enumerating text, but how can descriptions of text and changing what those descriptions provide crack open new ways of understanding the work that folks were doing, not just Black texts even, um, but a part of this talk that wasn't, um, that I cut for time, so I went down a rabbit hole of the Library of Congress's subject headings and of the um, shelving system. And they have a category uh, for white supremacist movements, um, but it's a very restrictive category. So you'd see white supremacist movements attached to a book on the alt-right, but you might not see white supremacist movements attached to a book on housing discrimination. And so one of the things that got me to think about was what would happen if, and the other caveat is caveats. The other caveat is um, under the subject heading, um, racism is something that happens to people. And so in the category enumeration, uh, if you wanted to talk about racism and housing, uh, it, it might look something like United States, Georgia, African-Americans, racism. And the same book, my and the book of book I'm thinking about is White Flight. So that would be the category that racism was sort of signaled in. But uh, for the other categories would go something like United States, Georgia migrations or United States, Georgia politics. There's no way to signal that racism is something that white folks do to other people. And so one of the things we can think about with doing bibliography, with doing cataloging, with enumerations is shaping how we categorize things to crack open and reveal the structures they participate in. So no list is um, passive or neutral. Mm -hmm. now, that, that was a rabbit hole. It was a fun rabbit hole to go down. I hated to have to cut it out of the talk, uh, but thanks for the chance to bring it back. <laughs> um, we're, we really have a lot of great questions here, so I'm just going to keep chugging along. Um, this one is from, oh, it moved. Yes, because someone, oh, people are liking it, so it's still moving. Uh, this is from Amy Gore. You mentioned moving, belong, moving beyond a troubling of the canon. Can you tell us more about how you practice this in your classrooms, especially survey classes? Yeah, so when I say moving beyond troubling a canon, um, I can say this because of the work of folks like Nellie McKay and Henry Louis Gates, who have given us a canon of African American literature and have fought that battle uh, with the American literary canon. And so to, to say move beyond troubling the canon, it's one thing to do in my context uh, of an early American lit survey to do a unit on transcendentalism or American romanticism, where Emerson, Hawthorne, Thoreau are centered, and then I add Francis Harper, or I add Douglas as the kind of diversity moment. Look, Black folks were responding to them, or look, Black folks were doing romanticism. Um, it's another thing entirely to sort of reframe that unit, say, in terms of romanticism, and to situate Douglas and Harper as people who were participating in their own intellectual projects that were running parallel to and intersecting with, say, Emerson and Thoreau, but that we really need to attend to on their own terms and not as an add-on to the canon itself, right? And so in that sense, I'm not jettisoning some notion of canon. You kind of have to have a principle of selection. But what I am saying is the canon, the core, is no longer the great white authors and we're adding people constellating around them. The core itself is always fluid. It's always in flux. It's always sort of multiple. And I've already seen in graduate seminars how that kind of teaching has shifted because once upon a time, we teach weekly and say, well, back in the day, people really read weekly as a kind of a sellout, right? She wasn't dealing explicitly with enslavement, et cetera. 
But now we're thinking about her irony. We're reading people like Alice Walker and June Jordan, who helped us really see Wheatley differently. And I started doing that routine in the class a few years ago, and a student said, yeah, 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 um, we already got that. That's how Wheatley gets taught now. And so I'm thinking, oh, okay, I was just reinscribing the canon, um, thinking I was combating it when I was, in fact, you know, putting it back in the center. And I could just move on and teach Wheatley. Another case was a student who was concerned about writing about Frances Harper, um, how much biography she needed to include in Francis in her article. And my response was, how much biography do people include on Hawthorne? How much biography do people include on Douglas? Um, at some point, we have to trust our readers and our students to catch up. And that expectation that you should know this sort of compels people to then catch up. That's a great answer. Um... I was listening so carefully, I didn't look to prepare the next question. Um, so from Brian Sinchi, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, does this kind of bibliography move us away from the limitations of the archive and toward a different way of collecting, grouping, and assessing texts? Maybe. Um... I suppose it might depend on what you mean when you invoke the archive. Um, I'm going to be really careful with that word. Uh, I think it it moves us, it helps us resituate and rethink the physical space of the archive as holdings, right? And what it can do and its authority over what's held one. Um, and so that, um, right, just because it's in, um, the, the, what am I trying to say? Just because an object has pride of place in a physical collections doesn't necessarily mean it should. And we should continually question how a thing uh, maintains and receives pride of place. Um, I, I was in a conversation with one of our um, gallery education educators here in the Johnson Gallery here at Cornell. And we were talking in a class about like where Cornell's gallery places non-European art and how do you label and situate artifacts in such a way that doesn't reinscribe a kind of Eurocentric Western values set against non-Eurocentric Western values. So that's one thing. The second thing is, yes, it should get us moving beyond those physical spaces and sort of written book artifacts to include people, to include visual arts, to include media. Um, there's a great moment in, um, Francis Harper has so many great moments, but in a sketch series in the 1870s, a young woman asks her aunt, um, who's lived through enslavement and the Civil War, uh, why don't you write a book? And the aunt says, I don't think I'm one for writing books. And the niece says, but your life is such a book, I would like to read you. Uh, there's a kind of intergenerational recognizing that lives themselves are things that we should train ourselves to read in collaboration. This isn't a kind of swooping down, let me hear your story and swooping back out. This is a in conversation and collaboration. I am attending to you and what you have to teach me. And hopefully this exchange is mutual. So I think that's what I mean. Uh, being very careful uh, about how I define archive in this, in answering. Thanks. Um, I'm just trying to go through here and look through the last few questions. Um, I think we have time for one more. So let's go with this one from um, Magdalena, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, but she asks, how can we push against journal editors and reviewers expectation that most of our citation of conversation with other scholars should be reduced to endnotes? That's a good question. Um, I think as someone who's now on editorial boards and faced with doing peer review, doing review, peer review, um, I'd say having that conversation with an editor, one. Um, two, 
I think it's a cultural change uh, that we're in the midst of, one that goes from the sort of singular scholar who's in charge of all of what's in the article to openly acknowledging collaborative work. And I think just the culture and the language and our forms of article production are just going to have to catch up to that. Um, I just read an article by Eric Gardner um, on this point, um, not on this point, but in the ASQ, Gardner actually cites talks and conversations. Um, and it flows with the prose. He talks about, he invokes those moments in the same way that he would invoke an article. And he tries to cite it. Um, um, it's the same with email. I don't think Gardner cites emails, but I, I, I see the same thing happening with email. And in my own, if you pick up the practice of citizenship, um, this is not a shameless plug, it's just an example. I actually cite um, a blog post that was a response to a talk I gave. I cite a conversation I had with a colleague. Um, I try in the, like I said, my footnotes, they're kind of like love letters, even though sometimes they have to be short. Um, and so that's what I'd say about that. But it's a good question. Thanks. Um, so we are now out of time on the Q&A, but I, I want to thank you for a really wonderful and thought provoking talk today. I know that I am going to be listening to the recording more than once, um, once we get it up. Uh, those of you who are interested in the recording and want to let your friends know, it should be in our YouTube channel next week. Um, and so thank you once again, Eric, Derek, we're just delighted to have you here. And now we will begin our annual meeting program um, with some recorded remarks from our president, Barbara A. Shaler. Um, please do